So yeah, yeah. yes. Go on. Yeah. So well, hello everybody, and and welcome to uh, to this next session of the CTA seminar. So today is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Peter, who is going to talk about all the new results on the CE sets. Okay, thank you. I, I, I uh, just sent everybody the slides so you could uh, follow along if you so desire. Um, okay, let's so make sure my computer, my thing is working. The change, yes. Good. Um, so uh, thank you guys for coming. It's the same kind of group we always see. Uh, I appreciate the attention. And so I did give a similar talk about this about a year ago. and. Uh, but I wanted to repeat it uh, because I had nothing new that I was allowed to say as I was explaining before the talk. So let me do that. So uh, anyway, so I'm gonna talk about some cute, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, I'm gonna talk about the computably enumerable sets and degrees. That's, that's one of my topics that I've enjoyed talking about over the years and doing research in. And I have some new things to say about it. We'll see, or what, at, least, at least we did. This is work with GNOME at the very end. Okay, so what's the domain of discourse? What are we talking about? So uh, we're looking at the computably enumerable sets. So that's just, I uh, you know, I call it E, right? So uh, WE is the ETH, it's a domain of the ETH Turing machine. So this is all related to computation. And so I look at the structure of all the RE sets under inclusion. So how they compare with each other in terms of inclusion, okay? And this is just a reminder, these are really the same as the sigma one sets, right? The things that, which are basically sigma one definable in arithmetic. And what's, what's very interesting or appealing about all this is that basically there is an enumeration, right? So every RE set is enumerated in some fashion, right? And we're not gonna really worry too much about the enumeration, but it's all uniform relative to all, everything that's going on. So they're all relatively enumerated with respect to each other. All right, and so that I just want to point out some things that we could say from there is that uh, zero, the empty set, one, the, which is going to be omega, uh, in union, uh, intersection, these are all definable from inclusion inside of the RE sets, right? And they're just generally true in any, you know, any set. Well, anything that was closed under intersection and union, that's, that's generally true. All right, so we could consider this as a lattice if we wanted to. Also, a little harder result, which I won't need today, is that being finite is definable. So a, a set is finite uh, if and only if every subset of it is computable. And uh, we know computable, I should also add computable is definable because that means it and its complement, right, are RE, right? So you have to have a little bit of uh, recursion theory facts to do that, right? So being computable means that you're, there is something whose complement Right, is there, your complement is RE. There exists something that gives you the union of everything. All right, and so then just for safety, all the, all the sets I consider are CE, infinite, co-infinite, unless somehow I otherwise know that they're gonna be different, okay? So they're all gonna be like that. Okay, so that's the, the domain of discourse. Now, why do I wanna study this? Why do I, why did I spend, you know, 20 years of my life uh, thinking about this? Um, good question. Um, you know, why do we spend any, any time thinking about all these things? Uh, well, I, I guess I like building things, right? And um, not very, hey, let's, let's, hey, can you mute everybody, Ludovic? And then just un I'll mute myself. All right, thank you. Um, uh, so if you have, please, if uh, let me just repeat here. I'm gonna try to watch the chat. Um, oh, I see this. Oh, um, thank you, Ludovic. Um, yes, so we're talking about the natural numbers. Um, I'll try to watch the chat. I'll try to look, look for questions, but I'm not always the best because I'm looking at my slides. I'm looking at the screen. So, you know, if you need a question, just, just, just unmute yourself and ask a question. All right, so back to why I like to do this is I, I like to build things. Um, 
And you know, it's kind of messy to actually build things in real life, like build a house or apartment building or something like that. So it's nice to actually just kind of abstractly build these objects. And uh, okay, so, uh, and then, you know, well, to me, the building our resets is you just have to, you know, come up with an algorithm that does something that allows you, you know, to build an R reset. So you don't even, have, and, and then if you're not, if you're not a computer scientist, you don't actually have to implement the algorithm. You can just say you have the algorithm and you're done. So what better way to build something than build an R reset? Okay. That, that's, that's my feeling about this is that, you know, I got away with building things by not building things for years. Um, anyway, um, so why do I do this? It's because really, I mean, so building, you know, I like to build RE sets that have basically certain properties relative to other CE sets. And same thing with degrees. So how complicated can you make these objects relative to other objects like them? Okay, that's really the kind of the question. And let me illustrate that with the theorem that's, that I, well, I'm just gonna, okay, sorry. Um, I'm gonna illustrate with that, that with a theorem in a second. But also one of the things about about these constructions is that it's incredibly, you use self-reference all the time. Um, I know that the people who don't like to use self-reference and still do these constructions, but for me, uh, I guess I've decided that really using, being able to use self-reference is the key thing. So I wanna have, uh, I, I wanna be able to use Kleene's recursion theorem and the, and the recursion theorem with parameters. So, um, so in, in, in essence, what that says is that when I'm building an RE set, all right, if I do it in the correct fashion, I actually know the index for that set ahead of time, okay? Now, the correct fashion is sometimes hard to fathom, but that, that's really the goal. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm building an RE set, right, if I do it correctly, I know what the, the index for that RE set is, all right? I have a program in hand for that RE set already. And moreover, with, the pram with the Kleene's recursion theorem with parameters, it means I could do this for lots of sets. In other words, if I'm building, you know, well, countably many sets, constructively, I could know those indices at, of all those sets as I'm building them, right? I, ha I have in hand the indices that I could do this. So as long as I'm asking, I could use those indices in my construction, if I'm careful, okay? So I have to be very careful how I do that, but I could use those indices to get information about those sets. So this makes for complicated, um, this makes for complicated constructions where you could actually ask information about these things. So, um, so that's why I like these things because they're complicated and you get this, these relationships going. And let me give you an example. So the example I wanna, I'd like to talk about is about the Scott rank. Um, so, um, this, so the, the Scott rank of E has, uh, uh, has, uh, well, it's at least Delta. If and only if you, if you look at the set of indices I and J such that basically W I and W J are in the same orbit. So what I mean there, we have an automorphism of E and these two sets are in the same orbit. So they look exactly alike in terms of automorphisms, in terms of definable structure and stuff like that. And now this is, this is, this is some index set, right? This is some, this is some you know, set, right? And so we can figure out where it is, right? So if it's gonna be uh, sigma zero delta, where uh, lambda, where lambda is just slightly bigger than delta, right? So let's not worry about the, this thing. So in other words, if they're close, right? Then we know this has degree uh, delta. Right now, it could have Scott rank omega CK plus omega CK, right? Then this, then this set here is sigma one one complete, All right? But you could go one more. I'm not going to go through this, okay? You could go to uh, plus one, which means there's a fixed set such that being in that orbit is sigma one one complete, okay? And so um, basically, what this says is the orbits of E gives you an example almost of every, you know, sigma zero uh, lambda relation that you, could, that you could possibly think of as you move forward. So every, almost everything you can think about uh, effectively, and I, I, I will say that if you're effective, you should be kind of 
below omega one CK, right? And even a little further, right? Everything you can think about is encoded in there. So that's about the best that you could do. So I guess what I'm saying is that this is, to me, this says, hey, you know, I, I wanna build this, I mean, so ultimately I did build this, well, the three of us built this A, we built this A, right? And so now how A relates to all these RE sets is a sigma one, one uh, complete set. So we had to build this set, right? So that's a very complicated object to actually get out. So I'm not going to talk about that construction today. After all, that's the old results. And so I want to try to talk about some newer results. Okay. Um, so, um, all right, so I want to talk about, uh, well, so I'm going to, I'm going to, A's just going to be, a, you know, um, an infinite, well, just an RE set. And so I showed that basically when A is low, right, well, let me give you this definition here first. The outside of A, L of A is a structure is basically you take the RE sets and the unit A to it under inclusion. So if you have a pic, uh, let me draw a picture here. Uh, let me change the color of this pen. Uh, I'll, I'll do it in this color. So um, draw a quick picture. So this is the natural numbers. Okay. This is your set A. And then let me just draw. Then you have all these other sets like this. And then who cares what they do below A, right? And those are your possible uh, sets. And so you include the red sets with the black set below there. And that's, you're looking at that structure. That might've been a little too much. Um, so, you know, you're looking at things like this and how they relate. All right. And so um, what SOAR showed, it, it, so then also when A is the empty set, this is, this is just, when A is the empty set, this is just everything, right? There's nothing down here that you consider. It's just E itself. And uh, A is low. That means that A jump is, 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 is jump is as low as it possibly could be. It's zero prime. You can't get any, that's the, you know, that's the lowest possible jump. All right, so SOAR showed, okay, that if A is low, then L of A and E are isomorphic. All right, so the question I wanna address here, or at least partially address is, um, for which A are L of A and uh, E isomorphic, okay? I, I wanna do this. And so, um, and this is gonna be about lowness notions. The answer here is gonna be about lowness notions, okay? Um, so that's, that's really what we're gonna do. We're gonna explore how lowness notions relate with having these objects being the same, okay? All right, so um, uh, this is a tough slide to look at. And so this is where maybe you wanna look at the, the slide offline that I gave you the link. And let me draw a picture of what this item awesome work system will look like, okay? So let me draw a picture here. Um, so, all right, so what we do is we start with a copy of Omega and another copy of Omega. I call it a mega hat. Now, over uh, over here, we have A. I'm going to put it in this color here. That's A. Okay. And now, what we want to do is um, so let's do this here. We have an RE set here, right? Let's call that. I'm just going to label it over here. U zero. Okay, I did it in red. It's completely out of our control. Okay. And now we have to respond that we have some we have some isomorphism that goes back and forth. I'm going to call this map phi. Okay. And now I have to respond and I have to draw, I have to draw its image over here. Right. And so that's going to be what I'll call U0 hat. All right, so I have to draw that, okay? I have to be able to somehow, that, that has to be RE, okay? That has to be RE. Now, let's see what I need to do to make this an isomorphism. So I got to go back and forth. So let's draw another set here. Let's draw this set here. And let me call that, uh, uh, I'll, well, I'll call it V0, okay? And it, it's, it's, now that's some RE set over here that's given to me. Okay, the red sets are given to me, 
right? The, the blue ones are the ones that I get to build, okay? So I need to build a copy of it like this over here, and I'll call that uh, V0 hat, okay? And, and so uh, let's just go again, right? Now, you know, so if I, I mean, so let's, I, I'm again given another red set here and let's just do it like this. Okay, so those two red sets don't intersect, right? But they both have, you know, some intersection there. And so now what I have to, so let me, let me, let me so that's, uh, I'll be uh, U1. Right, and then I will respond over here by building a blue set here. All right, and that will be a U1 hat. All right, and so uh, then I, I'm not gonna keep on going, but we wanna go back and forth, back and forth every time. So in other words, my opponent is giving me the red sets, right? And I am then responding by the blue sets. And the idea here is that this is a very complicated Venn diagram, but if each of the pieces, let me just draw a piece. So this is a piece here. This is the things which you're in, right? This, that's in, that's basically the things which are in that blue set. Well, that's a, you know, if that didn't work well, let me draw it over here. This is a red set and this red set, some of the stuff is in, in the, this blue set, some is in the blue, this blue set, but there's stuff that's not in both. Okay, so as long as basically the number of things here is the same as the number of things here, right? I'm in good shape. Okay, and so as long as it's actually the same number, the same cardinality. So I mean, by not well, not I mean in other words, if there are three things here, I have to have three things there. All right. Okay. And now, by the way, I noticed I didn't really count. I, I just kind of removed. You know, I, I wish I could. I just kind of removed. Oops, that's the wrong thing to do. Um, I removed uh, uh, this portion, A itself, okay? A is gone when I consider that, all right? The A is not there. All right, so let me slide back to this. So I just wanna go through and make sure I actually cover what I wanna say here. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm responding. These are the, this, so this is, so the way I'm thinking about this is that um, that basically uh, phi of the U sets is U hat and uh, phi inverse of the V sets is the V hats, right? So as long as I got that going back and forth, I've got what I need. Let's just make sure everything. And so the Venn diagrams, so if the Venn diagram, I mean, so it's just about Venn diagrams. How hard could that be, right? Really, really. I mean, don't we, don't we learn that in the first logic class that we maybe take as freshmen to avoid taking calculus? Just Venn diagrams. I'm trying to provoke some response out of people and that's, it's not working very well. So um, anyway, if, if you can't have fun giving a talk, why give it? So um, anyway, all right. Um, so what's, what's good here is actually SOAR uh, showed this result here that, um, it's enough that the Venn diagram, instead of actually having three things in each of the places, right? It's enough that either they're both infinite or both finite, and then you get an isomorphism, okay? So as long as I have infinitely many objects, uh, if, as long as I have infinitely many objects here and here, I'm in good shape, or here and here I have good shape. So in other words, and I, I've actually tried to make the Venn diagram so they're very clear where the corresponding place is, Right, but it does get more complicated as time goes on to actually do this, right? Because you have the set A here that's eating things up. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details of how that goes. Okay, so uh, that's the plan. Okay, and so okay, let me just point out here before we go on. I've actually used the recursion theorem because um, I built uh, these sets, all these blue sets I built. And I want to have the index for those blue sets as I move forward, right? And I need them by the recursion theorem, regardless of what I have to do, because I want to actually figure out things about the blue sets. Okay. All right. Um, 
Okay, so another another ugly big slide is that what, what do I want to use to what do I want to figure out? I want to figure out, you know, is this in, is this intersection infinite or not? But think about that. That that the way this is set up is that you're in that one here. You're in basically that set. You're in here, right? And you're not in here, right? That's a difference of two RE sets. Any one of these intervals, any one of these Venn diagram spots, is you're in some number of RE sets, and you're out of some number of RE sets, right? That's all this Venn diagram is, right? Now let's not worry about. I mean, modulo a. Any point in the med, you know, finite point in the Venn diagram, it's not finitely things you're either in, I mean, the red sets and blue sets, or you're out of them, right? So basically, these regions are difference of RE sets. Okay, each point in the Venn diagram is a is a, is a uh, difference of RE sets, and we just want to know if they're infinite or not. Okay, and so there's we're going to do this by two questions. Okay, two questions. One. Do infinitely many sets enter the region? In other words, because it's RE sets, there's an enumeration that's going on here. So do infinitely many sets uh, enter that region? So do we see infinitely many balls that enter them and they're, oh, they're gone, right? Isn't that great? I'll put them in again. Oh, they're gone, okay? So, but uh, I might have infinitely many that go in there. And of course, in this case here, uh, I mean, they do, they could, I could have things that come in here, right? But they later get enumerated to the red set. And so that's how they could go, all right? But I'm gonna ask that in two questions, right? So one is, um, do infinite many balls enter into a region? Okay, that's just RE, right? You're asking if there are infinitely many balls, which are in some collection of, of things and not in others. Is there some stage? Is there a stage where this happens, right? And now that's, uh, basically is, is asking really, uh, uh, it's asking basically if the RE set that, you know, so that's an RE set, right? Asking, are there infinitely many balls, right? Which are in some portion of this Venn diagram at some stage of my enumeration. That's an RE set because my enumeration is a computable object, right? So I had to make sure that this is a computable object, all right? And now, so this question basically corresponds to is some RE set infinite outside of A or is it just infinite? Okay, and this is just a pi zero two question. Okay, um, it's a pi zero A question. So it's about the infinite things outside of A. Okay, and now the key thing here is that what Bob Sower used is that if A, if A is low, well, this is not actually Bob Sower's original proof, but um, if A is low, then we know that, uh, any question which is pi zero two in A is delta zero three. Okay, so that's gonna be helpful in our construction. We're not gonna go through the, the, the tree construction. All right, and now, so that's the first question, right? The first question is, is any one of these spots infinite? And that turns out to be a pi zero two question in this case over here. So this, I'll write this down. This is pi zero two and over here, it's pi zero two in A, okay? Um, now, the other thing is, is that now you might have, okay, so you have all these balls that are hanging out there, but they might disappear, right? So they might disappear, oops. Um, uh, they might disappear. Um, boom, all right, because they go, they end up going over here. All right, and so that means that, what, what is that? That means that you, at some point, right? So every ball that gets into there from some point on, right? At a later stage, enter some new RE set, gets enumerated someplace a little further, right? Right, so that's that's sigma three, right? Because it says, you know, that for every, there is some X, it's just for all things, right? There's a later stage where I get in there, sigma zero three. And it doesn't matter about A at all in that case there, okay? So that part, right, we don't really, we didn't need lowness at all, okay? All right, um, okay. So that's, uh, so again, we're, we're kind of discussing Bob Sawyer's proof here, I'll remind you what that was. Um, 
about this. And we're just trying to see what happens. We got the idea what the isomorphisms look like. We have one place where lowness was used. And now I wanna, I wanna, now I wanna do is, um, now I wanna do is kind of abstract that out and see what else we need here. So, um, so a set B is semi low two. Uh, if things, if basically asking, hey, if um, WE intersect B is infinite or not, is, is, is touring below zero double. Okay, so the, the point is that that's all I needed to do with these with lowness. That's all I really needed is basically semi low two. Okay, um, um, okay, so that's all I needed for this first question. Okay, um, and now I'm not going to go through this, but if A is low two, then it's also semi low two. Okay, and so low two means your your jump is as, your second jump is as low as it possibly can be. Um, all right, um, let me see the time here. Um, okay. All right, so um, I guess I, I want to talk a little bit about where these low sets or semi low sets would be or whether they're not, not. And so uh, it turns out that every non low two set uh, contains RE set A and AB and A and B such that basically they're, they're I mean, they can be scattered everywhere. Every, anything that's possible occurs. Essentially, with these with these semi low two sets, or the complements of semi low two sets, and so and this is generally true for any any of these boolean combinations we think about, right? So they're not really um, unlike low and low two. They're not degree theoretic properties anymore. They're very much properties about the set, right? And they're and so if you take a non low two re degree, you could have any possibility of these lowness notions in there. Um, so, and um, one thing we, so the thing is uh, semi-low two is, uh, is too, too strong for our lowness notion because there are basically things which are complement of semi-low two, but L star is nine isomorphic to E. So, you know, we're trying to capture a lowness notion that basically sandwiches, you know, that, so in other words that this, uh, well, remember we're after here. Um, one of these things isomorphic, more after a low, kind of some kind of low lowness property. So semi low tuness is not enough. Um, okay. All right. So, but so all, but all the properties that we will want will imply that uh, A bar is semi low two. Okay. But they must be stronger. All right. And so I guess I should point out here is that um, we can't do any better no matter what we did. All right, um, because if you're uh, every non low two degree contains an RE set, just L star of A, the non isomorphic. All right, so you, you, in other words, being uh, semi low two is in some sense uh, necessary. Um, uh, all right, so um, so anyway, we're, we're not, yeah, we're not going to get there. All right. Um, all right, so now, all right, so now we kind of explored where one portion of Bob Sower used uh, lowness. And now we need to talk about another notion where he got uh, lowness. And let me do I have a let me go back to my diagram. I wish I had another blank slide, I'm sorry. But if we look at this, this this blue set here, let me cut a different color, sorry. We look at this blue set here. All right, I made it very blue. It disappears. If I look at that blue set, I, I'm putting things into that blue set, okay? That's my job is to put elements into that blue set. And let's say I know that, well, this blue set here, right? Well, let's just talk about one region of it. This blue set here, right? That image there has to match what goes on here in terms of the number of elements. So in other words, if this set is infinite here, this has to be infinite over there. But I have over on this side, I have an added issue is that when I put something into this blue set, it has to, I wanna make sure that I, I can't stop everything 
from entry A because I got A down here, but I but I want to stop at least infinitely much stuff from entering A. All right, so how do I stop these balls from entering into A? Um, so, all right, that's where I have to use um, this access. Okay, so this is what this is saying here is, you know, how do I make sure that this first V0 set is infinite and co-infinite outside of A? Okay, we want access. All right, and so um, we use this notion of uh, semi-lowness. So semi-lowness says that, hey, if WE intersect A complement is not empty, then it's uh, computable with zero prime. And you know you could go through the definitions. This is a sigma zero one and A complement question. So if A is low two, then it's actually delta zero two, okay? So that means by the limit lemma, we have an approximation, a computable approximation to what happens, all right? And that's enough. Uh, that's enough to, and so, by, by, so this, let me, before I go on, that's enough to, to get the access we need to build the set. Um, and let me, let me just go on here. So this is a, a lowness notion, right? And, and just like all these other lowness notions, in any kind of reasonable Boolean combination that you might want to think of occurs, all right, later on, okay? So they're everywhere. Let's see how we let's see how we do this, okay? So uh, there's a there's a proof. So what I'm going to do, let me just make sure I got the right notation in my head, is that let me draw a picture here. I want to use this and I want to explain how I do this. So basically, again, here's a copy of a mega. I'm making it bigger this time, and I, I think a ball is kind of like, uh, you know, dropping in from above, right? So you have some shoot, and there's the balls, and they enter in here. And now what I have is, I'll put down the red set here. Here's A. And now what I want to do is I want to build sets. I'm going to build them like this. These are FEs. And I want to make sure that I basically, I want to put something in here, right? And I want it to stay, and I want it to stay out of A, okay? And so I want it to stay out of A. Right, and so now what am I going to do here? Let's go back to the slide. So um, I it finite many sets. They're all some we. They're all non-empty. All right, that's my picture. This is equal to some. I mean, I should call it we, but in other words, I have an index for it. That's what I mean from the recursion here. I mean, it may not be the same one as f sub e, but it's the index given to me by a parameter. And I could ask. I want each one of these sets to be non-empty. Right, and so. I ask, hey, do, do I think there's a ball in there? So I ask, you know, so as I see a new ball enter, here's the next ball that's coming in. I say, where should it go? Well, I'm gonna look for the first place. This is not empty, there's nothing in there. And I feel that the answer should be, uh, well, I, the next fresh ball, I'm gonna wait for something to go into that. And then I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna put that in here and then I'm gonna speed up time. I could just wait for time to happen until this uh, G of EX equals one. In other words, G thinks, oh yeah, there should, that ball is in there. I put a ball in there that's outside of A and I believe by a G that it's outside of A forever, okay? Now, if what could happen, either I'm gonna get to the place where G is one or it'll drop into A, okay? Um, right, and, if it, and then I'll just repeat that until I get a ball in there, right? So eventually this, this process eventually puts you know, finally many balls into each of these Fs and at least one of them remains outside of F. In fact, there's only one ball outside of F each time. And then I could define this uh, V sub zero to be every other ball, right? So maybe I'll do it in a different color. It was supposed to be blue. So the blue set I want was this one, this one, this one, so on and so forth, right? So if you go back to my other diagram, I know this is, you know, if I go this, so this, uh, this blue set here was constructed by taking every one of the S. Okay. Okay. Uh, so again, right, using semi lowness, I was able to pull this off and I used the recursion theorem and, uh, you know, that provided access to things. All right. Um, 
So SOAR actually showed that if, you're, if A complement is semi-low, then L star of A and E star are effectively isomorphic. All right, so now I want to go off a little bit of a tangent perhaps and talk a little bit about uh, low orbits for a bit. Um, so uh, if, you're, if A complement is semi-low, then actually A is in the same orbit as a low set, all right, but not necessarily in an effective orbit. I mean, the isomorphism I build right, theta, I mean, whatever, phi, I'm sorry. It could be effective itself, but it need not be. But, um, okay. Um, so, and the issue really when we do this is, 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 uh, is covering regions. So if you go back to the picture again, so now what you have is another, uh, set, you have another set here. Uh, like this. Okay, I'm just going to disappear in a second. And now what you're thinking about is these port, these parts here that are shaded, they fell in and you have to cover them on both sides, right? And if you could do that, you could build an isomorphism. So you have to just do a little bit more covering. You have the shaded part and you have to make sure that the regions where you cover are exactly the same. And uh, that's what they were able to do in this case here. Okay, and the, and the key thing here that they could do is that uh, these sets that you put in, they're finite right? So I'm not gonna go through the details, but they could make sure they cover because uh, basically they don't have to take, so the, you don't have to, they don't have to take infinite action to build that set. They only have to take finitely action. All right, so now this is, I, I, this is a question here. So a Russell Miller showed that, um, if you have a non-computable RE set C and, it, and A is semi-low, A complement semi-low, then A has an isomorphic image, right? So in other words, it's, there's something in the orbit of A which avoids the cone above C. Okay, so this is cone avoidance. This is like a great, if we, I mean, it's still open if I just give you A incomplete. Can it avoid, you know, is there something in the image of, no, an image of A, something in the, in the orbit of A which avoids the cone above C? I mean, this is a classic result that we'd like to do in computability theory. Can we avoid the cone above something? And it's completely open if we can avoid do this when A is incomplete, okay? And I should say it's, it's partially answered for when A is complete. Some of the, some complete sets only have things which are complete in their orbit, but that's not a complete classification of all the things which are complete. So it's unclear. Um, So it'd be, I mean, one nice, I mean, so it'd be nice if like, um, well, okay, Rachel Epstein proved the result that if you're a prop, there's a properly low two degrees, so everything in that degree is isomorphic to a low set, right? So in other words, being low two, properly low two, right? Or non, you know, non-low low two is not enough to say, you know, in other words, those sets still have some kind of lowness properties that we're interested in here. Okay, so, you know, so, at least that's at least to me that the low associations are a little bit bigger than low sets. All right, and so now we could go into what sets are already effective to automorphism sets, right? And so um, again, the answer is we don't we don't know. It's complicated. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip this slide. All right. Um, all right. So um, all right. So now. We're still going to work on the on the lowness issues. Oh, sorry, on the act. Sorry, the axis issues. But now we're going to get axis in a different way here. We're going to use that uh, set B is semi-low 1.5. Now, if that if the set of E such as W intersect B, right, is basically uh, well, it's one reducible to M. So, in other words, asking whether something is inter intersect B is infinite is asking whether some RE set is infinite. Okay, and so I'm not going to go through this, but being semi-low two, this is stronger than being semi-low two, weaker than being semi-low. Okay, um, so in terms of the, so that means in terms of the informational content, it has the same informational content as semi-low two, but it has not, it has, you have to have access differently than semi-low. All right, and so Moss proved that if these, if A complement is semi-low 1.5, then these things are isomorphic to each other. Okay, so he solved the axis problem here, right? To pull this off. And so uh, 
the way he did that is using what's called the outer splitting property. And so um, let me draw a picture here. So, um, so we have, um, I'm sorry, over here, we have, there's omega, we have a set A, and now we're given, well, let me just draw another set A. We're given some WE that looks like this, perhaps. And what we wanna do is we wanna split this set into two, all right? So I wanna split it into two, like that. I sliced it in two. And now what I wanna have here is that uh, this part here is finite. Okay, so there's only finitely many things in here. Now, by the way, it doesn't say that this, this part down here is finite. There might be infinitely much stuff down there, right? So this is this slicing. It's not a, I didn't take a finite piece off. I took a possible infinite piece off, but just the part that's outside of A is finite. And I want to ensure that if WE is infinite, then that piece, that little blue piece is not empty. Okay, and this was done, I mean, this was done these are computable functions, right? So they're, it's a computable splitting. It's done uniformly, all right? And so if you go back to my picture, um, okay, if you go back to my picture here about when I, when I did the splitting, now I could, well, I should have another picture. I could, I could kind of play the same game here, right? In this, what well, I could before, each one of these sets, each, each one of these squares here is I'll take, in other words, I'll take this set that I've drawn here. And now, now I'm going to take, I've taken this set here and I split it once. Now this, this part over here is another RE set, which I know by the recursion theorem. So I can split it again. Okay. And then I could split it again and I could split it again. And I could split it again. I love splitting things, right? Um, so um, it's much easier than splitting wood, splitting these sets. Um, anyway, so then I could use the, that splitting to do what I wanted to do in the previous time there, okay? So uh, that's how that worked out. Um, okay. Uh, now this is a tricky one here. It turns out that if you are something like 1.5, then you have the out of splitting property. And, uh, so if you want to figure out one proof in this talk, this is an easy one. I'm, I'm giving you the main idea and then uh, you could try it, right? Um, so what you want to do is uh, you're going to basically play, you want to split this, you want to play that uh, W F of E intersect A complement is empty. If you think about that, that's actually going to be, uh, well, that's, uh, that's uh, well, well, and then, okay. So both these objects are gonna be M reducible to, to inf, okay? And so you could, uh, you could play them against each other, right? Because this, this one here is because of semi lone tuness. So uh, it's a cute proof. Um, you know, basically you do one thing when, you know, you know this, this might be infinite, I gotta do something. When then it's, and then it's not up to, you know, back and forth, it's a fun. All right. Um, so, okay. It would have been nice if, uh, if uh, some of the 1.5 were, were the answer. Okay. And so um, uh, this next slide tells you that no, semi low 1.5 is not the answer. So uh, Harrington and Soar have this property, not low, which is definable in E. So it's a definable property um, such that if, if non low holds, then A does not have a semi low complement. Okay, and moreover, there is a set A with semi-low one-point complement and not A. Okay, so this set can't be isomorphic to a low set. All right, so now you could ask all kinds. I mean, so a lot, of, not, nothing's known here about um, sets that that satisfy uh, not A and have semi-low one complement, right? And so you could. There's lots of questions that are there, and I'm just going to skip them for uh, lack of time. All right, so then. Um, this is the old, an old result. So uh, where I got into this in some sense years ago, 
is uh, if A has out of splitting property and A complement is semi low, then L star of A and E are isomorphic, right? This is something out of my thesis. So um, um, anyway, so that was so that was enough, right? So just just having the out of split, you know, the, this, so this was a result that allows us to separate the first time the informational content from the access, right? So up until this point, we weren't doing that, okay? All right, so now here's the new result. And this is a result of myself, Rod Downey and Noam. Is Noam still there? I think so, yeah, he's still there. Yeah, um, no more chats, I'm just looking around the screen. Um, and so what I've tried to explain here is the issue is access, all right? And so the, obviously the solve this problem it's gonna be much more complicated to pull this off. So we need to have uh, better access. Um, um, or we have to be able to solve the access problem. So how are we gonna do that here? We're gonna use domination. Okay, so uh, we have well, two functions, G dominates H. If basically some, for some point on, G is bigger than H. You know, I think you could draw this. Okay. The one on the top is dominating the other one. And then uh, I'm going to, well, so let me, let me skip. Let me, since, well, let me, let me skip the definition of high, but let me just point out if you're low, this is the key thing. If you're low too, right, then there is going to be a function G of degree zero prime, which dominates all A computable functions F, H, okay? So if you're low two, you have this, there is some function G, which you could just be given, okay? Uh, which dominates all A computable functions H, okay? Now, of course, you don't know where, where they start. Okay, so you, you don't know where they start. And so you have to, you could use that. So let's see how you could pull that off. So here, let's see, I do have a picture. I'll do a diagram here. So um, change the color. So now, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to kind of be the same uh, thing here. I'm going to build these sets here, and I'm trying to avoid being eaten up. Okay, so now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, you know, some, I want to put something in here. So anytime, anytime this, uh, you know, I want to put things in there, but anytime it gets, they get eaten up by A, I have to put something in there. And so instead of putting just the less ball, I'm just gonna like make these things huge. So if I have to, I'll like, oh, everything goes into this set now. Everything I got, just eat it up, okay? And now what happens is, so uh, again, the same set of the same sets, I wanna make sure they're not empty. And basically if it's not empty, I have every ball outside of A below some large number. So large number means, when I'm doing this construction, for me, large means bigger than any number ever considered. Okay, so I just plop everything in there. So everything that, if I, if, if I ever find a set has been dumped into A, I just grab everything, right? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find, I have to use this to find some function which is A computable, and that's how I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna define basically H of, uh, I used the wrong, I wanna erase some of this stuff. Um, uh, I'm going to define that function, and I'm just going to find that with basically the largest element that's in that little, it's in the group. All right, now that means anytime that that set gets emptied into A, I'm allowed to redefine the use, okay? So that's an A computable function, right? And it's, if, if these boxes, if these blue boxes turn out to be, uh, if they settle down, I have a, a, you know, a computable function. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details. And now what happens is if I built this function properly, and this is just an idea, huh? this is a sketch, right? Um, if I built these functions, then G has to dominate it, all right, some point on. So then I could basically e, G, e, K certify these balls if, well, G thinks it's bigger. G's gotten bigger, right? In other words, G's, you know, the approximation to G has changed, but the approximation to H hasn't changed. All right, so if I've done all that, all right, and then, you know, if you followed everything, I know it's like, you know, the last four minutes of the talk are the hardest, right? I mean, that's where you solve all the problems that are on the, on the exam, right? All right, so the students, you know, maybe pay attention. 
I don't know. Anyway, um, if you've done that all right, um, you'll get you'll get almost all these blue boxes are going to be uh, almost all of them are going to be emptied outside of A, right? And what's also going to be important here is that um, so you're going to get them non-empty. But what's also going to be important is that uh, some of these balls are going to be freshly certified. In other words, they'll be fresh because now you have another problem is that you're putting things into you, so you have to you have to do this for multiple different K. You have lots of different versions going around for each K. Whereas before access is done very uniformly, you could just build it and you had it. And now you have, instead of having one place to get access, you have infinitely many places to get access and you don't know what to do with them. So you have to do for each possible place for access, you have to do another bifurcation new retreat and they may interfere with each other. And so you have to make sure that basically that's why you want them to be fresh. So in other words, they haven't been meddled with by things other K, okay? So, um, okay. Oh, okay. So um, anyway, I, I think I want to stop here and uh, I want to thank Ludovic for uh, inviting me to give this talk. I hope he's not too disappointed. Uh, Noam for listening to this, me mangle his, our results and uh, uh, everybody else for listening to me. And uh, Peter, I, I think you have a glass of wine. Peter Hammond, do, do you have enough for everybody? Is it we have any wine and cheese afterwards? You have to unmute yourself. Unfortunately, it's just water. I just came in from a long walk, so I was <laughs> no wine. Usually, usually I would, but not this early in the afternoon. <sighs> well, with COVID, I think all those rules are over. <laughs> anyway. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, for your talk. So is there any question? No questions? No question, well, everything seems what, to be what clear. Is, what does this say about a characterization of the- Oh, uh, it's gonna be really hard to get so characterization. You yeah, you can't get one, it's, I mean, not a- no. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, why is it going to be very hard? I mean, I say why you think it's hard because I think it's you know. Well, I, I mean, okay. So I, I haven't explored whether it's even unsolvable, right? In other words, it, it, you know, so you could look at the set of indices, right? So I mean, let me let me draw this. So uh, uh, the set of i such that w i, well. So I don't even know what the complexity of that is. It could be very, very complex. Yeah. Okay. Um, the problem is that the 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 problem is is that the techniques that happen with um, the earlier result. So the very uh, um, this result here about the sigma one one completeness. Uh, I mean, that's a similar question that you could ask, right? right. But that is. Um, those results, um, they're actually not, a, I mean, they're not about what happens on the outside. So I, I think actually uh, this is less than or equal to like sigma zero eight. I think that's results from Leo, you know, in mind that you can bound that below, below sigma zero eight, but I don't know. Could it be sigma zero three, sigma zero five? I don't know. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy, easy to resolve. That does that help, Richard? Yeah. Well, it, it it was a surprising result, but it made it, as I said, just made me think that the chances of getting any sort of lowness type characterization was going to be very unlikely. Yes, so, I think that's correct. I mean, maybe it would occur if, um, I mean, it was surprised to me that low to, well, okay. It, it wasn't so much a surprise to me about low to being nice square for the E star um, E. Uh, it was just an access issue and it was complicated to work out, right? And so um, um, I, I haven't pushed it further than that, right? I mean, I guess in some sense, you know, I've been bad. Uh, 
we haven't written it up yet. So I think that might be the first step before we push it a little further is to write that up first. Um, let me say it like that. I think we should, I think we should write this result up first before we try pushing it a little further. I think that's fair. Okay, any other question? So, so maybe, but maybe you, you have something about the the degrees here. I mean, if you have all the low two are isomorphic, then it, you know, I guess in every non-low two degree, there's some set that isn't isomorphic. That's right. And so, but there also is something that is. But something that is right. <laughs> So it's not degree theoretic, right? So there's no degree theoretic. Right. Um, but you know it's going to be, uh, well, you don't know it's going to be, yeah. I got nothing mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, there's some technique, you know, the stuff we did earlier. Uh, Leo and I did about the, the finability of the isomorphism that turned that turned us to looking at the thing. I mean, so the, the result, the the mega ones, the the Scott rank result about E, there was a lot of the finability results that built up to that that told us we had to go this direction. I haven't taken those results and looked at them in this direction here at all, right? Just I just haven't had the energy. There's it's been yeah. Remember, yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the question. Okay, so is there are no more questions? So thanks again, Peter, for this very nice talk. And so, well, uh, I hope we'll we'll see uh, one day uh, a characterization of this because it's very nice. Um, it's burning in your head, right? What what is what could it be, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so let me stop it.